We learned woodworking, we learned how to buy the right tools and to get the right equipment from, um, from the hardware store. And I also feel like there are a lot of lessons learned that you can't teach in the classroom at all. Um, and then the end product was that we got to listen to radio waves that were coming from the sun and Jupiter. And we tested it the last week of school and it worked and it was awesome. Um, and so how has classroom teaching informed my work on education at a, st at a startup? It's vastly different, but a lot of the things that I do now at CardoDB are actually really similar to what I was doing when I was a classroom teacher in Arlington, Virginia. And one way that I feel is analogous is we have these maps at CardoDB called Torque, oops, called Torque Maps. I guess it's not animating, nuts. Let me try that one more time. It is here. Oh, it is there, okay, cool. Um, so we have these maps at Cardo DB called Torque Maps, which are temporal maps. They're fully zoomable, like the rest of our maps and a lot of the maps that you see on the internet. And what I like about this one is that the, um, the time component is people waking up in the morning. And this is a map of tweets that mention sunrise in different languages. And it's around the same time that my students and I were building the radio telescope last spring. And um, every day somebody wakes up, they learn something new, and then the next day they need to learn something different. And they change through time, just like our understanding of the world changes through time. And another thing that I've come against um, being in both kind of like the technology world and the education world is I really crave answering questions and solving problems for people. And lately I've become a little addicted to GIS Stack Exchange. And, um, and this question was on there about a week ago. And I thought it was an interesting question because of the difference in time scales between technology and continental drift. So GPS, you can get maybe your coordinates within the time scale of about a second or so, but continental drift, like a continent will drift a meter in maybe a hundred years or more. And so there's this vast difference in time scale, orders of magnitude different. And it reminded me of um, the question, how long does it take to become an expert in something? So if you wanna learn JavaScript, how much time does it take? How much time do you need to invest in it? And um, it obviously varies by the person, but um, one number that people kind of agree on is about 10,000 hours, which is about 3.6 times 10 to the seventh seconds. And then I also thought, so that's analogous to continents drifting. It's kind of a longer term scale thing. And the other question is, how long does it take to find the information to become an expert? So that's more GPS fast. So it's like a half of a second on a Google search. So again, it's a giant time scale difference, orders of magnitude different. Um, but this is what a teacher has to deal with when teaching something to somebody. You have to be slow and patient and meticulous. Um, even though all of the information there to learn it is instantly available. Um, one thing that I learned at my job through CardoDB is our CTO said the best way to learn to program is to program, which sounds a bit like a tautology, um, but what he means is similar to what I experienced in my classroom making a radio telescope. Learning through projects is really rich and you learn a lot of things by accident that you didn't intend to learn. And there are a lot of things in tutorials and um, kind of prepackaged educational content that's not necessarily there. And um, sometimes surprises are the best part of learning. And when you're a classroom teacher, if you get a surprise while you're teaching, you can go with it and it can end up being some of the best classes that you've ever taught. Um, so not being scripted, I think is part of um, what this is saying. And so that brings me back to the radio telescope that I built. Um, so the, the previous picture you saw, that was just an antenna. Um, the antenna receives radio waves and the receiver part was the electronics part that my students and I put together. And um, this is just a little animation. We're just toggling the buttons and then it shows some of the innards of the radio telescope that we soldered from, by hand. Um, so my first experience with maps as a professional was in grad school and I studied physics and I did not study geographical maps. 
I studied maps that represented the phase space of a particle, so the position and the momentum of a particle, and you map them in 2D coordinates. And I was looking at um, trajectories that were really close to being periodic, but were still chaotic. And so I was looking at the statistics for those. And so um, in my previous life, life as a physicist, this, these are the types of maps I looked at. But now working at CardoDB, I can run the simulations and upload them to CardoDB. And I can get maps like this that um, show the exact same type of simulation. But it shows, um, it shows the same type of particle movement at a fully zoomable level. And it's a different way to visualize it that I never would have thought of before if I hadn't worked for this company. So we do a lot of um, kind of brainstorming and trying out new ideas. And um, one afternoon, I just threw the data set into here. I had to change the coordinate system, so it worked perfectly with web, um, the um, Web Mercator pro projection. Um, but it was kind of a nice surprise that my past life as a physicist um, transitioned well to some of the technology we use at CardoDB. Um, the orbit that I studied was the blue orbit that kind of skitters around. It's the chaotic orbit, but you can see it gets kind of stuck on the more periodic ones. Um, and another quote that um, it's a little banal, but is the best way to learn is through teaching, which is pretty true. Um, there's a lot of other points in life when you can't learn by teaching, obviously, and there are richer ways to learn. Um, but when I was a student teacher, um, my students skipped class one day. They told me they were going to the principal's office to talk about graduation, but they drove to the grocery store and bought a cake that said, good luck, Mr. Equals MC Squared. And that was pretty fun. But, um, but after I was a student teacher, I was a high school physics teacher. And I started getting frustrated with worksheets that people print out and students had to fill out. And then I got tired of paperwork. And I wanted my students to learn programming more and see that programming interfaces with um, a lot of the sciences that they're interested in. And I wanted them to communicate the results openly and then try out some new technologies. And so one of the things that I did when I was teaching high school is um, I pushed my students to learn IPython notebooks as a method of communication. And I posted them on my GitHub repository for my class. And I offered them extra credit if they ever did a pull request to correct anything or to add any additional materials. But um, they weren't very motivated to, do, to use GitHub. They were a lot more motivated to build a radio telescope instead. So this project didn't work out too well. Um, so back when I was a teacher, I did this type of thing. But a year later, um, I did some work with Plotly to just show that CardoDB and Plotly work really well together in IPython notebooks using our SQL API. Um, and we just um, published a blog post about this, and Pl Plotly did as well. And also, here at CardoDB, one of my main projects is to work on the Map Academy. It's um, open source as well, and we have a GitHub repository for it. Um, in the Map Academy, we have several courses um, that we've developed. Each course has many lessons within, within, it, within them, and a lot more are in the works. We have a lot brainstormed, but it takes time to re write really good content. So we try to get up about one a month or so. So Academy has its own repository um, in GitHub, in the CardoDB um, kind of big repository. And you can see the link there. It's academy.cardodb.com. And we spend a lot of time um, trying to make this really good. Um, and then I get a lot of help from my colleagues revising materials, um, trying to generate better ideas. And another thing I really like about this and something that I was really craving for my students when I was a high school teacher is to, um, to issue tickets in GitHub. So if you see something wrong, try to fix it or to do pull requests. And what it, one thing I really like about Academy is that the community participates in it and tries to make the content better. And then other people within the company um, also like do pull requests and issues. And it feels like a good community um, building common educational materials together. Um, another thing that we do at CardoDB is um, we share all of our materials as openly as we can. And I did a webinar on a type of map that we make um, from private data. So the maps are public, but the data is private, so it cannot be scraped. 
And um, typically what we do is we uh, do write-ups as GitHub gists, and then we share them openly and um, encourage people to look at them later if they missed the, the webinar. Or, um, and we also use them as templates for future workshops that we do. Most of our materials are stored within a repository that's kind of in beta right now that we've been working on. So a lot of the workshops that we've been doing over the last um, about three months are in here. And I tried to visualize a map showing all, all the locations that we've done workshops around the world. Um, yesterday, um, I was in Stanford with my colleague, and so I input that data point, and so that's in there now. Um, but my colleague Aurelia, she was in Buenos Aires and then Beirut um, just last week. And so you can see the global scale of the amount of people that we reach through our workshops. And um, one goal of this training, um, this training website that we have is that we want to make it available to as many people as possible and specifically educators. So if there's a professor at a university that wants to teach CardoDB, um, they can see some, um, some workshops that we've done. They can um, fork it, alter it as much as they want, and they can have it as their own educational materials. Um, the repository is also in GitHub. Um, and um, please check it out. If you guys want to um, fork it, please do it. Um, other stuff that we do at CardoDB, we try to engage the community as much as we can. We're based in New York City, and there are a lot of educators there, a lot of people thinking about maps, a lot of people doing really awesome things. And so in about two weeks, we're going to have our second educators night. Um, if you're in New York City at this time, um, please contact me. Um, we'd love to have you guys come. And um, another thing that I've noticed um, in the last couple months when I've been doing a lot of educational materials, I noticed that uh, there's this Phosphor-G Academy that has really excellent, really well thought out, very um, authoritative lessons on how to do all things GIS in the open source world. So they're using a similar model to what we're doing, so it's exciting to see that others um, are doing the same thing. Um, so that all brings me back to this map again, so to show how things change in time. So when I was growing up, I loved maps. I had a map above my bed. At home, I currently have a map as a shower curtain. Um, I think maps always um, influence people's lives, and especially this community here. Um, but what I really like about my job is that I get to see how maps change um, people's interaction with their world around them. And um, time is a big component of that, like I said. So um, just kind of to sum everything up, I guess I'm about a little short on this talk, but um, what have I learned? Um, I used to think that high school students were really complicated, but now I'm realizing that it's such a small audience and a, a narrower demographic that teaching open source to a more global audience is really, really, really hard because knowing our audience is one of the hardest parts because the skill sets are so broad, people's backgrounds are, are very broad, language is oftentimes a barrier. Um, so high school students I still think are pretty complicated, but um, compared to what we have to prepare now, I think it's a much harder task. Um, engagement is obviously very important, um, but at the same time, we have to balance quality and the design of everything, so we don't want to write things that are like, um, like too um, like short-lived or um, we want to write meaningful content. And we really strive for quality and then um, to wrap it nicely in design so that um, people will want to use it. And another thing that I've learned is that sustained concentration has really big payoffs in education. So um, we strive to have very comprehensive materials and we're always striving to, to keep doing that. And when I was teaching, um, the students that always did best were the ones that could concentrate for long periods of time. And um, they were greatly rewarded for it. And so that's the end of my talk. Um, happy mapping, and thanks for listening. Does anybody have any questions at all? What's going on in this picture? Oh, that's our radio telescope. So that's the antenna for our radio telescope. Yeah. And that's my student, William, or former student. Yep. 
Yeah. Did you have any sort of background mapping before you started with targeting DP? Or was it just sort of learning on the fly? Um, I had some programming background from being a physics in um, physics in grad school, and then I had a lot of background in um, very similar mathematics. Yeah, so there's overlap, but um, I picked up a lot of stuff um, through working here too. Yeah. Did you find that challenging? I did, but I um, actually feel a lot of bliss and ignorance. Like it feels like a really big motivating factor. So um, I've really enjoyed like learning things like PostGIS that I didn't know previously. And um, so with a lot of the work that I did with physics, it was um, like, like a lot of the boundary conditions were really similar for the types of maps that I dealt with. So it, I don't know, there, there is a lot of overlap, but there's a lot of not overlap too. So I don't know. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Okay, well thanks for coming everybody.